Good day, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Occurrence Removal and Regulation of Nanomaterials at Publicly Owned Sewage Treatment Works. That's a prompt to me to begin the recording, and I have done that. I'm pleased to welcome our presenter, Paul Westerhoff, from the School of Sustainable Engineering and the Build Environment at Arizona State University. Let me tell you a little bit about Paul, and I'll ask him to say hello. He joined ASU in 1995 as an environmental engineer. His research is in the area of emerging contaminants. That sounds interesting, doesn't it? Emerging contaminants and innovative treatment processes for clean water. Paul has a, a strong research group, and that group has over 185 peer-reviewed journal publications. If you ask Paul what his research focus is, at least his website says, and I bet you he would say too, innovative treatment processes using nanotechnology, and then characterization of natural organic matter in natural systems. And then interestingly enough, detection and exposure um, assessment to engineered nanomaterials. Paul, that's a great uh, research background. Welcome to uh, today's webinar. Well, thanks very much. Your audio, you level sound, your audio sounds really good, and why don't you just go ahead and take it from here? Great. Uh, I think it's a real honor to give this uh, webinar, and especially to have people from K through 12 and in different countries. So uh, thanks for your time. Uh, the way we've set it up is to hopefully I'll talk for about 45 minutes, and then um, through the chat uh, room, uh, we'll go through a variety of the, the questions. So I think uh, the, the title uh, will become a little bit more clear as we kind of get into the presentation. I'll have just one background slide and then I'll start to show kind of the outline of the presentation. So overall, you know, what I'm going to try to communicate today is that uh, nanomaterials have both uh, a wide range of benefits and, and I'm sure that um, this NAC network uh, has heard a lot of those and that's what I call good nano, that they're trying to take advantage of the unique nanoscale properties that, that arise at the quantum size that give rise to unique mechanical, optical, electronic, and magnetic, and whole range of other properties. And however, you know, there is a risk, and that risk is maybe a workplace exposure, maybe environmental exposure. Uh, for example, here is a, a lung cell that's uh, kind of harpooned by a carbon nanotube. Uh, the cell is still alive, but uh, obviously you would not feel very comfortable being harpooned either. So uh, things, some of these will affect function rather than just uh, cell death. And I'm not going to talk a lot about toxicity today. It's going to be a little bit more focused on exposure to nanomaterials. And just to kind of lay the network, uh, there's many different definitions. The definition uh, I'm showing here is nanomaterials are operationally defined as having one dimension less than 100 nanometers. And with that, uh, I'd like to kind of show the, the outline I'll walk through today. I'll spend quite a bit of time talking uh, about how we use nanomaterials in society today. Um, and then the release, and I'll show why in a little bit, why I focus on wastewater treatment plants, and then where does this water and other stuff go uh, in the environment. So I'll walk through these different, these different categories. So first, uh, you know, nanomaterial is used in society in lots of different ways, and this is the same kind of visual uh, diagram of what I'm, I'm showing. And society can emit things to, to air, uh, into water. You know, for example, there's uh, nanoscale titanium dioxide in your toothpaste. You know, what do you do after you brush your teeth? You spit it down the drain and all of a sudden it magically disappears, but actually goes and mixes in with sewage and shower water and wash water and industrial water to a wastewater treatment plant. And then some of that will get treated and discharged to a river where fish live downstream, but we also drink water downstream. So not everyone can live upstream of a city. And other you know, places that um, uh, material will get discharged from a wastewater treatment plant, they have solids that they produce, which are essentially growing bacteria, can get applied onto agricultural land. About 60% of the material that gets applied to agricultural land represents about half percent of all the agricultural land in the U.S., but it goes there. So I'll, I'll talk through first again how society is using these nanomaterials. And here's one example of uh, essentially a mass flow diagram for nanoscale titanium dioxide. And you can see the size of these arrows represent the flux of a nanomaterial over the course of a, a year. 
Uh, and I made a big red circle here around the sewage treatment plant. And so whether it's production or use in society, a lot of this nanoscale titanium dioxide goes to wastewater treatment plants. And so that's why I'm focusing on this. And you see another large dark arrow goes to landfills. Pretty much once it's in a landfill, it's, um, you know, accessibility to the environment decreases quite a bit. So that's why I'm focusing on this sewage treatment plant as we, as we go along. I want to back up to this first, this production, manufacturing, consumption. This is really kind of how society is using nanomaterials. And this is one way that a center that uh, I direct called the Life Cycle of Nanomaterials, funded by the US EPA. Uh, it's a group of about nine universities that were looking at different product lines that include nanomaterials. And I'll, I'll walk through these more in a moment. But on this axis, um, I'm plotting from kind of left to right here nanomaterials that might be freely dispersed into, say, uh, polishing fluids in this product line A. Uh, and these might be nanomaterials that are somewhat passive. Maybe they're just mechanically polishing uh, something, or they might be more chemically uh, reactive. As maybe they have surface functional groups uh, that make them interact with materials. Product line B looks at nanomaterials dispersed into fluids, gels, creams. These are things like toothpaste to donuts to shampoos, uh, those types of things. You can imagine then that some of these are going to be passive and some are going to be reactive. So sunscreen, for example, nanoscale titanium dioxide is intended to be active in terms that it uh, reacts with photons so you don't get skin cancer. Uh, product line D looks at nanomaterials that are attached to flexible surfaces like fabrics. So uh, I'll show some examples of this, but the nano silver is intended to be added as an antimicrobial agent. So it's meant to be reactive, it dissolves, releases silver ions, which kill bacteria. Uh, you might ask why you do this, but you know your clothes wouldn't don't smell. And this is in active uh, product uh, line equipment from gyms and other things. Product line C is nanomaterials embedded into polymers. So this is like uh, carbon nanotubes and tennis rackets. Right, so what that means is because they're embedded, they may have a much lower uh, potential of being released. And they add things like silica dioxide into floor coatings to make them harder, to make them last longer uh, as they wear away. So I'll talk about these four uh, product lines in more detail. So product line A, maybe this group knows a lot about. Uh, things like industrial polishing agents in the you know semiconductor chip manufacturing, chemical mechanical planarization, uh, fluids are used to uh, make computer chips. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Silica, aluminum, and cerium oxide nanomaterials are the most common. And these will oftentimes, they're in water, and they're washed off the wafer, and they go into uh, wastewater. Uh, it's not designed to end up with nanomaterials in the finer consumer product, but there's both workplace exposure as well as release into the source. Some of these ne aren't necessarily required to be treated and removed prior to discharge in the source. So it mixes with our shower water and other things. And there's really no direct regulation of these materials other than maybe just if there's some turbidity or solids uh, associated uh, measurements um, with them. So these are, are widely used uh, materials. And they'll definitely end up in the environment. And some of these, uh, some of these are metallic and there's ways to measure these. Uh, I'm not going to go through this table in, in detail, but there's been a lot of work over the last decade on advancing our way to measure nanomaterials and finding an analytical method that allows you to show, as in red here, different detection limits. So milligrams per liter or much lower, you know, uh, about 10 or 100,000 times lower concentrations in terms of parts per trillion, uh, a very low level. So some of these we can measure at very low levels. Some are more difficult. So this is an ongoing research field to be able to detect nanomaterials at environmentally relevant concentrations in complex matrices ranging from lung fluid to urine to food to water and soil. And so here are these uh, transmission electron micrographs of these nanomaterials that are used in this polishing. And we can characterize these in these feedstocks very well. We can image them and we see that some, like this colloidal silica, occur as individual nanomaterials. Some of these nanomaterials are fused together 
And so the individual or primary nanoparticles are very small, but this larger agglomerate or aggregate uh, is much bigger. And same with the cerium. Some of these are cubic instead of round, and the aluminum will also have different shapes. And so there's ways to characterize these in these bulk fluids that you'd buy uh, quite easily, but once they get in the environment, it's harder to separate and identify these materials. Now, some uh, industrial manufacturing complexes will have on-site uh, wastewater treatment, on-site treatment before they discharge to a sewer or to a river. And this graph just shows that for, say, that removing the silicon nanoparticles, uh, if they were to change the pH of the solution by adding things like lime, uh, they can achieve fairly good removal of these uh, nanomaterials uh, in, in the water. And there's other ways, again, to look at this efficiency, not just for silica, but if you can raise the pH up, and they do this already to remove things like copper, which is regulated. So if they have softening systems that can remove copper, they can also do a, a fairly reasonable job. Over 90% of some of these nanomaterials uh, can be removed. And you see the aluminum is a little different, and that's partially because the aluminum is reactive and starts to dissolve a little bit, and so it changes the chemistry from a particle to various intermediate forms. So that's one way to remove nanomaterials. Another way would be to use a, a membrane, uh, you know, a membrane that would be used, say, under your sink to remove uh, viruses or, or pathogens. And so we've done a variety of experiments looking at different types of membranes, polysulfone, uh, nylon, and other membranes, using different types of nanomaterials, whether it's silver, titanium, or gold. And you can have these as either negatively charged on the surface or positively charged. And we've investigated how these nanomaterials interact with the membrane. And one is that even though these, all these nanoparticles were only about um, 10 nanometers in size, they were able to be removed uh, quite well by pores that might be you know, 200 times, or sorry, 20 times their, their size. And so what this graph is looking at is the amount of nanoparticles that pass through a filter. So a value of one means those nanomaterials move through. And what you see then are some small bars here uh, in the green, and this is for the positively charged nanomaterials. And so what happens here is they essentially absorb onto the membrane. They never make it uh, through. And this is both representative of a treatment process, but also what happens in, say, biological membranes and the interaction of nanomaterials uh, on different surfaces. So it's a, a charge attraction as well as a char or size separation. So this kind of shows that there are ways to put in controls to, to control the release of nanomaterials from industrial uh, processing. Now we want to go a little bit closer to something that we do every day. I'm sure a lot of us have brushed our teeth today. So there's nanomaterials in, in um, toothpaste. A lot of toothpaste contains about 1 to 5% by weight titanium dioxide. Some will also have nano silver in it to prevent biological bacterial growth in the toothpaste. If it doesn't have nano silver to do that, it will often have other chemical antimicrobial agents like triclosan. But we find nanomaterials in lots of our food products. Uh, it's uh, titanium dioxide and silica dioxide are added for texture, for color, for anti-caking, as oxygen barriers, a whole range. And really there's very little regulation that exists other than once you put in about 1 or 2 percent or higher, you have to just list it as an ingredient. There's been very little monitoring of this, but you can imagine that when you ingest titanium dioxide, it doesn't disappear. It will go through you. It'll end up in you know, the toilet and then end up in a wastewater treatment plant. So you'll see that the theme of, of these things being released into the wastewater system. We've done a lot of work looking for nanomaterials in different types of uh, consumer products. This graph shows the occurrence of titanium, uh, specifically titanium dioxide is shown in the bottom right hand side here. About for about 30 percent of the particles in food grade titanium dioxide are nanoscale. And where are they found? They're predominantly found in things like the chewing gum, uh, some beverages, but lots of different candies from M&Ms to um, uh, really anything that has a, a white uh, coating or white uh, candy uh, material, uh, whether these are candy canes at Christmas or, or other products. And so 
We ingest somewhere on the order of 5 to 10 milligrams of titanium dioxide per day, each of us, uh, in, in, our, in our daily uh, diets. And it turns out that if you look at some of these things like candy, uh, it actually is biased towards um, children. So children actually have higher exposure to these nanomaterials in their diet. So there's thousands of products that might contain titanium dioxide, and we spent a lot of time characterizing them. But what you can do, and what we're doing in our Center for Life Cycle of Nanomaterials, is going back up the, the food chain, essentially. We're going to the food manufacturers, the, the raw ingredients that they buy. And so you can buy metric ton quantities, and we've done this from different suppliers in the U.S. and China. And we've characterized these materials, and you, we can characterize them and by fairly complex methods of uh, transmission electron microscopy, uh, XPS, and, and uh, XRD analysis to really understand what's there. We can do this at that stage of kind of the, uh, the food chain, whereas once it's already put into your toothpaste, it's more difficult to characterize this chemical structure. So we can fingerprint these nanomaterials and differentiate them from nanomaterials that might be occurring in nature, for example. You can also buy a whole range of products here. I'm, I'm just expanding it to other food products. I don't know how many of you might drink things like nano silver or meso silver, but you can buy these products that have nanomaterials that are 10 nanometers in size. Uh, they're supposed to increase uh, vitality, and they change the microbiological flora in your gut. And so that'll be a theme I talk about today, is that the interactions of nanomaterials with bacteria. And so here it's an intentional uh, change in the, the, the microbiome of your gut. Not only can you buy nano silver or nano gold, uh, but nano platinum, nano iridium, and nano zinc. So these are commercially available and even sold at large uh, box stores. That uh, So these are used by, by consumers in kind of a, a homeopathic uh, treatment systems. So again, we, we eat a lot of these nanomaterials, and we really don't know the fate of these nanomaterials too much after we use them. And here are just some examples. These aren't only in food products, but even uh, vitamins and probiotics. Um, uh, some of these probiotics, your question, why would they put nanomaterials into a probiotic and the same material, in this case silica dioxide, into taco seasoning? They're actually putting it in for its unique nanoscale material property is a high surface area and it acts as a desiccant. So just like you'd get a little packet of a desiccant in, uh, in maybe uh, a, a box of tea or something, uh, the nanoscale uh, material will absorb a lot of liquid or water vapor. And in this case, for the probiotics, uh, they want you to take the bacteria and they need to keep it dehydrated. Uh, you don't want to activate the bacteria. And some, some of this will have several weight percent of, of silica dioxide. So again, some of these are somewhat surprising, but you know, I, you've probably seen something that, that you've been eating. And so titanium dioxide kind of, uh, and silica dioxide exists in many of these uh, foods. And again, we can image this on the left-hand side is from this food-grade supplier. On the right-hand side is silica dioxide we've actually extracted out of that taco seasoning, for example. So that's the product line B. Product line C is another way we use nanomaterials in society. These, again, are, are plastics and other things that are impregnated with nanomaterials. For example, a lot of plastic containers can get embedded with nanomaterials so you don't get bacteria growing on the surface. I'm going to talk a little bit then about product line D. These are things like uh, fabrics that you might impregnate or coat with nanomaterials. Again, antimicrobial agents, so your, your socks don't smell or your athletic clothing don't smell. Uh, you can buy self-cleaning clothing that have silica or titanium dioxide materials on them. Uh, makes it hydrophobic as well as potentially photoactive or even flame retardant coatings. So one of the questions is, as we wear these, do we release nanomaterials? Or for this story here, in terms of if we wash them, do they end up in a uh, wastewater treatment plant? So we've actually done studies, and other people in Europe and other places have done studies where you take these clothings, you wash them, and in our case, we attach nano, silver nanomaterials in very different ways, uh, these four ways on the left-hand side. So how you affect the nanomaterials will affect whether uh, you release nanomaterials into wash water. And of course, this wash water from your washing machine goes down the drain to a sore system. 
So then the question is, what happens at, as all these industrial sources from polishing agents, from the stuff you flush down the toilet, from washing machines, from hospitals, from all these different locations, they blend and they go to a, a wastewater treatment plant. And so just a general overview about most wastewater treatment plants is the size of these arrows represent kind of where nanomaterials are going. But there's a, a settling tank. Uh, this is just a, a large a clarifier that settles out heavy material. And then there's biological processes. These are designed to remove carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, viruses uh, through biological processes. Essentially, you grow bacteria, and the bacteria degrade and transform organic material. Then you settle out the bacteria in the secondary settling. Um, the, the clarified or water off the top go, will be uh, maybe put through a membrane before it's released uh, into a river or lake. But the material that settles, again, that's mostly bacteria at this point, will recirculate. And so water might move through the system in a matter of hours, but by recirculating the bacteria, uh, they stay in here for you know, five to 20 days. Uh, and that allows them to grow and multiply. So this is a, a very dense biological uh, system. So the question is, where are nanomaterials removed? Well, even by, by the time it travels tens of miles down sewers, nanomaterials start to stick onto clays and other things that will settle out. So you get quite a bit of removal just in this primary settling. Even though it's not the individual nanomaterial, it's what the nanomaterial is attached to. Then a lot of nanomaterials will absorb onto the bacteria. So just like I showed that the, some nanomaterials absorb onto the polymeric membrane, we'll see shortly that you know, about 90% of the nanomaterial mass or concentration will be removed by absorbing onto bacterial surfaces. So this arrow down the bottom is where a lot of the nanomaterials will go. And we can do various experiments in our lab to evaluate the relative removal efficiency of um, nanomaterials in different types of water by bacteria. So we count this bacterial biomass as something called total suspended solids. And the EPA had developed some quick tests uh, in the 70s to evaluate the removal of chemicals. And this has worked very well. And so the EPA wanted to uh, know if this method could be applied to industry or other sources to simulate and regulate the removal of nanomaterials. So here's an example. This OPPTS is a very specific EPA protocol. But then uh, this graph is showing the removal of three chemicals, uh, not nanomaterials, but three chemicals. EE2, synthetic estrogen. This comes from birth control pills, essentially. Uh, and what we did here is we did experiments looking at the percent that would associate with fresh wastewater biomass at a wastewater treatment plant. And then following this protocol, you actually freeze dry this biomass. And so they show up pretty good agreement. Methylene blue is a dye similar to the stuff that might come out of blue jeans or other things when you wash them. And silver nitrate is a salt once it's put into water dissolves. And this shows that silver ions will essentially absorb onto biomass and you can use this test. So the question was, does this test also work for nanomaterials? And so this graph shows on the x-axis a number of different nanomaterials that we investigated. Now the red bar shows this fresh wastewater biomass. This is wastewater bacteria from a wastewater treatment plant. You see uh, some nanomaterials are removed on over 90%. Uh, some under these conditions, at least, are removed less than 40%. Now when we freeze dry the biomass and follow that EPA protocol, for some of these we get almost no removal, but in all cases, the blue bar is significantly lower than the red bar. So it says that if we freeze dry the biomass and apply the standard test, we really underestimate the removal capacity of bacteria. So this is bad uh, in terms of industry because uh, they wouldn't be getting the credit for a wastewater treatment plant to remove these nanomaterials before they'd be discharged into a river. So we've done a lot of work working with the EPA and with different industrial partners to show and improve how you do these types of tests and that the tests developed for chemicals can't just be blindly accepted for nanomaterials. And we've explored why this occurs. Why does a bacteria, when you freeze dry it, not remove nanomaterials? So this graph again shows a red, same type of data as the previous one on the x-axis for different types of nanomaterials. On the far right is a, a silver uh, ion or silver salt. Let's focus on the first 
three sets of bars. These are nanomaterials. And what shows is that when we freeze dry to this blue bar, we get reduced removal capacity of these, these dead bacteria. And when we dry it, it continues to decrease. And so this is kind of like taking you and putting you, or let's say taking a, um, taking a grape and turning it into a raisin. So you're dehydrating this. And as you're dehydrating it, you're actually breaking down various parts. And the most important part turns out for uh, this process is the, the lipid or the liposome or kind of the oily fraction that kind of serves as the, the bacterial cell wall. And so when this is intact, nanomaterials really like to move to this interface of the, the, this liposome or this oily face and water. And the analogy here is salad dressing. So salad dressing, say an oil and vinegar salad dressing, is oil and water. And we were taught in high school that oil and water don't mix. But they never finish that sentence. And if you finish that sentence, it would be oil and water don't mix unless you add nanoparticles. So the, what nanoparticles do is when you mix it, it forms an emulsion. And it's because nanomaterials like the energy, the minimized energy at this oil-water interface. And so you form this emulsion that then allows oil and water to mix. And it's the same thing that's going on in the bacteria here. That is, nanomaterials like this interface between the oily lipid uh, surface of bacteria and water. So if you dehydrate that interface and break up this liposomes, you will decrease the removal capacity of nanomaterials in this simulated test. So we then, once we've understood how to do this, uh, we can work with this fresh biomass and we can work with a range of different nanomaterials that we find in commerce to understand their potential to be removed in wastewater treatment plants. And so the question is, okay, we can do these experiments in little beakers, but are they representative of what can happen at, at, as you start to simulate kind of more active, full-flowing wastewater treatment plants? And so we can do some tests that look at this part of the wastewater treatment plant and really understand how they interact um, with how nanomaterials interact with bacterial surfaces. Well, these are called sequencing batch reactors. Not too critical. Here's a little image uh, of one. It's uh, about a gallon in size and pretty standard to do this type of uh, lab scale testing. So I'll so show some examples of these sequencing batch reactors where we start off first. This test went for a year, so something graduate students love. But uh, over the course of 330 days or so, uh, what we show is that in this black line is what's called total suspended solids, or TSS. It's the amount of bacteria that's there. So most of the time, wastewater treatment plants operate at about 2.5, uh, it should be grams per liter, not milligrams per liter, but grams per liter. I'll, I'll show why we decreased this over time. And so essentially, all the nanomaterials were removed under that uh, scenario. So then what we did, um, for the uh, first oh, 90 days or so, is we added C60. These are buckyballs, 60 carbons uh, together. We added at about 0.75 milligrams per liter. Then for uh, between day 90 and 120, we decreased that to uh, about 10 times lower concentration. And then we raised it up. So this red dashed line represents what we were putting in every day, uh, twice a day, new water into this reactor. So it was continuously being added. Uh, bacteria were growing in here. We were adding food. And the question is, you know, was this C60 removed? And so this red line represents the difference. Again, the red dashed line, what comes into the reactor. The red dashed line would be the treated water. And so we see, you know, for the first 90 days, again, we see very good removal. Um, and again, initially, you know, even before we started this, it was, we had too much bacteria. So we wanted to decrease this amount of bacteria and then we kind of kept it constant at this about 0.5 uh, gram per liter uh, level throughout the rest of the test. And we see very good removal, greater than 90%. We decrease on day 90 the amount of fullerenes in the influent water, and we go down almost to below our detection levels. We increase the amount of uh, C60 on day 120, and we keep it there. Now we start to see things bouncing around a little bit, and I'll discuss some of these uh, reasons here. But we continue to add the C60 throughout. Now we, you know, a wastewater treatment plant is not getting just one nanomaterial. It's getting things again from industry, from your toothpaste, from everything. So in this case, we started to add a second nanomaterial starting on about day 150. And here we started adding nano silver. 
So between day 150 and day 180, we added nano silver, then we turned it off. Uh, day 210, we turned it on. You can see kind of this, this cycle that we did. So what you can see is as soon as we started adding nano silver, uh, this black line goes down. Essentially, we killed all the bacteria. And so this was horrible, right? I mean, we weren't. Uh, we killed the bacteria. The red line here shows that we weren't getting any removal of the C60 anymore. And so essentially, we've upset this reactor. But what we see is very quickly, the black line comes back. And so what in a wastewater treatment plant, it's not one type of bacteria. It's a real mixed consortium. It's kind of like that example I gave with the nano silver beverage early on. You take some of these to change the function of the bacteria in your gut. Here, the silver is changing the function of the bacteria at the wastewater treatment plant. And you can see that uh, every time we, uh, here at day 2 210, when we turn it on again, we detrimentally impacted uh, the biomass. And then at day 220, uh, first we let the biomass concentration increase before we turned on the nano silver. And here you see a, a drop, but it wasn't continuous, completely wiping out the wastewater treatment plant. So at normal operating conditions, you could probably handle these pulses of nano silver, but it will be changing uh, the microbiome. Uh, this green line just shows our ability to remove nano silver. And when the system's operating well, say between day 160 and 180, we get greater than 50% removal of this nano silver. And we did other measurements and actually found out that, you know, actually more of the silver could be removed. Uh, it just was associated with bacteria that didn't settle out of the system. So that gives some idea of, of we can do experiments and beakers and other things, and we can do some modeling. And we've done this and essentially have showed to the EPA that these beaker scale tests that we, we developed can simulate that type of uh, reactor that I just showed. And I won't go through the data, but th these lines overlap saying that we have a, a predictive uh, capability now. So the question is, after water then goes through a wastewater treatment plant, we have treated liquid that gets discharged to uh, rivers. So let's look at, at this water. And so uh, this graph shows titanium dioxide and the headworks, primary effluent. This moves through the wastewater treatment. And this tertiary effluent, this is what gets discharged to, the, to a river. Uh, this is a log scale, but we see about 90% removal of the titanium dioxide from the water. And in this case, it's accumulating in these solids. This is where the bacteria are. So we get about 90% removal. This is a full-scale wastewater treatment plant treating water from about a million people. We've gone to a number of different wastewater treatment plants uh, across Arizona. We measure titanium dioxide in the headworks or what comes in and in the treated effluent. So again, you see greater than 90%. This is micrograms of titanium coming out that would be discharged into a river. And we can image that we do have small nanomaterials actually being discharged, but again, we removed more than 90%. And so now, what with this type of information and this one to 10 microgram per liter of titanium, now we know what fish, what bacteria, what algae could be exposed to, or if you go swimming, what you could be exposed to uh, in rivers. Now, what about where the, we grew the bacteria, most of the nanomaterials went on to the bacteria. Where does this stuff go? So this, the settled bacteria is called biosolids. Um, you can actually buy treated biosolids in um, Home Depot and Lowe's and apply them in your yard, but about 60% actually does go uh, into uh, un applied onto different lands. And so let's take a little bit closer look at the nanomaterials in these uh, solids. Uh, so we call this nanoprospecting. But you know, on the left-hand side is titanium dioxide that you find in toothpaste. On the right-hand side is titanium dioxide that you find in wastewater biosolids. So it's not a perfect match, but it shows that we can find essentially untransformed nanomaterials in some of these biosolids. And we can go through and we can find other things. These are electron micrographs on the bottom and elemental uh, analysis on the top. So we can find barium sulfate calcium phosphate, so things like calcium phosphate are in um, you know, calcium supplements and baby formulas. We can find zinc uh, materials and iron oxides, nanoscale materials. We can find sodium tantalates. Uh, these are used in some laundry detergents. We can find iron and silver sulfides. So yeah, we can find silver materials there. Um, we can find uh, lead, 
um, and other materials that are released from our premise plumbing. So on the right-hand side, this is an image of uh, a lead nanoparticle. Uh, it probably wasn't used in commerce. It probably formed or was released on lead pipes. So things like this are what happens in places like Flint, Michigan. So when this gets into our stomach, um, it can you know uh, break down and get into our bloodstream. So these types of lead nanoparticles can also affect fish and other organisms in the environment. We find very interesting complexes. So we it turns out that you know these full-scale wastewater treatment plants uh, have a lot of nanomaterials that accumulate them. So where do these things go? The, the pictures that I showed you in the bacteria, a lot of it again goes to landfills. I mean, start, gets applied onto agricultural lands. Here's a, a system uh, from Texas that's been that receives wastewater biosolids from Austin uh, area, and it's actually a controlled site where they can apply different amounts, you know, from 10 to 30 um, tons per per day sorry, tons per acre per year of these biosolids, and they've been doing it for, uh, you know, a decade or in some cases even longer. So we can go to these sites and we can measure silver and we can measure titanium. Uh, for example, with silver, uh, these, uh, what we see is that most of the silver accumulates near the surface in the top 30 centimeters and doesn't go very deep. So uh, if this gets uh, you know, mobilized through dust or other things. This is where the nanomaterials can get mobilized or the, the worms and other organisms living there and the birds that eat the worms uh, can get exposed to the nanomaterials. For on the right hand side you see titanium dioxide and in black is kind of a control site. This is uh, somewhere where no nano, no biosolids were applied. So you see that we have much higher levels of titanium uh, materials and this does seem to permeate or percolate deeper into the soil. And we can go there and we can image uh, on the um, on the right hand side titanium dioxide and I, I think the left uh, uh, is also titanium dioxide but we can find some silver nanoparticles. So again the titanium dioxide that's used in toothpaste or, dunk or donuts end up in wastewater, they end up in the biosolids, they end up on the land. So these things don't ever really truly uh, disappear. We've also done the final set of experiments I'll show is how do addition of nanomaterials to soils change the microbial activity of them. And so this is a soil respiration test over 28 days. We essentially measure the, on the y-axis the production of carbon dioxide. Essentially bacteria breathe and respire just like we do. And so the control has no nanomaterials in it. The first bar is um, nano silver either one milligram or a thousand milligrams per kilogram of nanomaterials that we added to the soil. And so you see a little effect from the one milligram and you can see that essentially we've turned off the CO2 respiration at very high levels. So if we go back just uh, two diagrams here, you can see the levels of silver here are in this tens of milligrams per kilogram. So it's somewhere between a slight effect and a large effect. And you can go through and do this with titanium dioxide. There's a slight effect. Uh, zinc oxide, there's a, a harsh detrimental effect. And then the cerium oxide, you don't see the same uh, detrimental effect in, in this test. And so every nanomaterial is different in terms of its effect on soil and soil respiration. And here's a slightly different type of a test but shows very different answers. And so uh, we have two sets of symbols that are color coded and essentially the, the uncolored ones that go over this time uh, either are the control sample or things that have marginal uh, differences. And so what we see then in green is an adverse effect. Again, a decrease in the CO2 production. That comes from the zinc nanoparticle. But in this case, what we see from the addition of this cerium oxide and this type of uh, a respiration test is we actually see a huge increase in CO2 respiration. And so here it's not killing the bacteria, it's actually helping the bacteria degrade its food in the soil. And so you can actually see that there's applications developing around the world where cerium oxide nanoparticles are now being applied to agricultural crops to stimulate biological activities around root zones. So not all nanomaterials are bad even when they get in the environment is the story I want to say here. So hopefully to summarize this and then get to your questions, 
is that nanomaterials are emitted from a wide variety of sources. Hopefully I can show you that you're responsible for using and emitting some of these nanomaterials, even if you didn't know it. And these will end up in wastewater treatment plants and sewers. And that while there is some ability for industrial processes to remove these on site, they're not always required, but they can be effective. And that one of the unique things about nanomaterials I touched upon, whether it was on the wastewater treatment bacteria or on the soil surface, is that nanomaterials like to accumulate on interfaces. Uh, this is true in the environment. It's also true in your lungs. It's true uh, in lots of different places. And so this is one of the unique fate and transport aspects of nanomaterials. And finally, at current levels, the levels we're using of engineered nanomaterials today, while at high levels it can affect wastewater treatment plants, the current levels really are not high enough to detrimentally affect the efficiency of a wastewater treatment plant to remove organic chemicals that are pollutants, to remove viruses, and to purify water. Uh, but if they were in the future released at very high levels or in pulses uh, from, say, an industrial spill, they could have adverse upsets at these wastewater treatment plants. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge the funding from a variety of different sources. Uh, this presentation was kind of put together uh, from a, a bunch of work we've done over the, the various times. So uh, hopefully we're pretty close to ending at the, the right time for the formal presentation. And then I'd love to be able to... Uh, address some of the questions. So I, I guess, do you want me to address the questions by chat or do you want to ask, uh, ask those to me? Uh, Paul, I'd like to ask them of you, if I may. And, uh, and, and you're perfectly on time. We appreciate that very much. Um, there's a whole slew of questions and let me see if I can, I'll probably ask you the ones that I'm the most interested in first. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but you were talking about, towards the end of your talk, nanoparticles in soil. Is there a, does, does one measure a half-life? Is there such a thing as a half-life uh, in soil? How does, do they naturally degrade? Or are, are those sort of measurements made? Yeah, so it's a really good question. So, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, so again, I said an alternative to something like nano silver was triclosan, an organic chemical. And those organic chemicals you do think of as having half-lives as bacteria break them down. So nanomaterials, um, it's a little bit more difficult to think in terms of a half-life. Uh, so I'll give two examples. Titanium dioxide uh, is really pretty inert. It, it doesn't dissolve. It doesn't microbially degrade. Um, and uh, it doesn't oxidize very easily. So it really doesn't have a half-life. Uh, but people have thought about half-lives in a slightly different way for things like titanium dioxide in a river. That is, you know, how long does it take? How many miles downstream does it take uh, before the titanium dioxide essentially agglomerates with bacteria or other particles in river and settles. So that's one way. Now the silver, uh, silver and zinc, uh, one of the reasons these are used as antimicrobial agents is that the nano silver is really a, a delivery mechanism. So whether it's silver, zinc, or copper, and copper is widely used in impregnating um, things like, uh, uh, you know, pressure treated wood for outside to prevent biological growth. So there, what you want is actually a slow release mechanism. And so if you have it, you can imagine if you have a big piece of silver, it doesn't have a lot of surface area. Again, one of the unique things about nano is very high surface area to mass ratio. And so the, the way that a silver nanoparticle dissolves is from the outside into its core. So it'll start dissolving. So that rate of dissolution, it's dependent upon uh, things like pH, the oxygen content of the water. So there in a very clean system, you could predict what your view of a half-life would be. But one of the things that happens uh, with all metals is they build up scales. So silver, for example, in a wastewater system gets coated by sulfides. Uh, silver, so you form these inert silver sulfides. It turns out to be like a, an impermeable glassy layer on the outside. Uh, you can also have that occur with silver chlorides on the outside. So it's not as clear on how to come up with something like a half-life for these inorganic nanomaterials? So it's a very good question. Yeah, I remember from my chemistry class, those silver solubilities, silver sulfide solubilities are extremely small. I mean, those are like rocks, you know? 
So exactly. And that's where, you know, in a wastewater treatment plant, most of the silver ends up as silver sulfide. Same with uh, zinc and zinc sulfides. I didn't realize that. You know what yeah. I was fascinated by, Paul? I didn't realize that nanoparticles tended to like interfaces. I think that makes sense. As soon as I saw that, I said, oh, that makes sense. But it hadn't occurred to me before. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, even when they're charged, but even if when they're uncharged, you know, so one way to look at chemicals and how they behave in the environment is to do something called an octanol water partition coefficient. So you take octanol, an organic solvent, and water, and they form two different layers. And normally, if you put in a dye or something, you'll get a distribution between those. With nanomaterials, again, they move into this interface. And so this is called a Pickering emulsion. It's used widely in industry for a variety of things. And again, we use it every day in things like salad dressings uh, to make these, these emulsions. Uh, to hold oil, uh, fats, and, and water together, uh, they will use nano nanomaterials, and the same thing then happens in the environment. Hmm. Another question, quite a few questions in the chat window. Um, is there a baseline of of nanoparticles, a variety of sorts, from the natural environment that you uh, that's out there? Yeah, it's a really good question, and you know, analytically, it becomes very challenging to sometimes to differentiate. So, uh, you know, people have generally been nanomaterials into three groups. I've been talking today pretty much exclusively about engineered nanomaterials. And then there are these natural nanomaterials. So you can have iron sulfides, for example, uh, or silver sulfides and, and, you know, from a wide range of clays. And so, uh, you know, in a typical river or ocean or groundwater, you have something on the order of, you know, 10 to the ninth particles that are 10 nanometers in size per liter of water. So, you know, trillions of, of particles in that size. And what are they? They're clay, they're uh, viruses, they're debris of different things. So there's lots of natural nanomaterials. And then we also have a class called incidental nanomaterials. These you can imagine as being combustion byproducts. Uh, in the air, you call these ultrafine materials. Uh, but these combustion products and other incidental nanomaterials will also get into the environment. And regulatory agencies are interested in, in differentiating them. Uh, sometimes they can have you know, the similar health effects that when you inhale them out of air or when you drink them or in, their, in our foods. But uh, they're interested more in regulating and understanding how to regulate uh, the engineered nanomaterials. Um, and so it's much similar to, say, the discharge of a, a, any metal. Uh, you know, an industry responsible for discharging the metal, there's still metals in the environment, but we, we don't regulate uh, them the same way. hope that helps. It's a, it's a pretty complicated, uh, well, obviously a pretty complicated system. Here's another question for you. I have to admit it's mine. Um, when we think about safety of these things, is it particle size or is it concentration? Because, let me elaborate. I sort of think of these things going in, no matter what, into some sort of colloidal form, ultimately, right? They're going to be clumped together or collate together or something. Um, maybe, I'm not sure what the what I'm saying, but let me say this. Is it is it particle size that, that matters, or is it the concentration in micrograms or nanograms per liter? What, how do I think about this? So, right. It, it's always the dose that makes the poison, for, for sure. So. You know, I focused a lot today on kind of exposure, right? So the other side of kind of risk management is, is hazard. You know, what's the toxicity of these things? And so lots of people have done toxicity work. Um, they work a lot with uh, lung and lung cell types of materials for thinking about workplace exposure. Uh, there's not as much uh, in terms of ingestion of nanomaterials. Uh, there's some work on dermal exposure, uh, even fairly damaged skin, you know, our, our skin is a pretty good barrier against nanomaterials. Um, but in lungs, you know, people have seen that the small size allows, just like ultrafines and air pollution, allows them to penetrate um, uh, more. And of course, the aspect ratio, whether they're long and skinny or spherical or, you know, different uh, shapes affect their uptakes into cells. So you can see movement of nanomaterials across cellular barriers. And in terms of, you know, concentration is for sure, you know, one of the, the key drivers, much more so than, than size. 
Um, but size will have an effect then where it gets distributed in your body or in a fish's body. Um, and I think that the, the challenge of nanomaterials is for organic chemicals, we can say there's aliphatics, there's aromatics, there's alcohols, there's alkenes. We don't have that same uh, you know, decades right. of, of, right. of description of how to characterize these different attributes of nanomaterials yet. Hmm. Here's a question. We're fascinated, first of all, by nanoparticles in taco seasoning. I mean, those, that's, that, those really are nano sizes, those anti-caking agents that are in there? Yeah, and so a lot of these anti-caking agents are silica dioxide. Uh, it's very similar to the fumed silica that's used in the uh, CMP, chemical mechanical planarization. Yeah. That is the primary yeah. particles are about you know 10 to 20 nanometers in size, and they're kind of fumed together. Uh, so there's lots of different regulations around the world as to how to characterize a nanomaterial. Is it a primary particle or is it an aggregate? And there's different number based and stuff. So uh, yes, we can find. Uh, very, you know, so I uh, forget the exact number, but you know, lots of these food will have on the order of one to three or four percent by weight um, silica dioxide nanomaterials or titanium dioxide nanomaterials, and um, we and others have found you know nanomaterials in a whole bunch of things. Um, I'll, I'll give one example that might be initially worrisome or surprising, so uh, but it turns out to be actually a good thing. So uh, you know, we can find nanoscale calcium phosphate in infant formula, you know, baby formula, powdered baby formula. And uh, so it turns out these are needle-shaped uh, calcium phosphate. And in Europe, they're warning and banning these in, in cosmetics that you apply to your skin. But yet we find them in infant formula. And so it turns out that when you make these, and, and these could be dangerous to interact with cells say, in, in, a, in a child's uh, in, in, in digestive system. But it turns out as soon as it sees anything below about a pH 5.5 or 6, which you would see in your, your stomach, these things rapidly dissolve. In fact, they dissolve better than if this was not a nanoscale calcium phosphate. So in some cases, the size helps lead to this half-life that you were talking about. It helps this delivery technique. So while sometimes we can be scared about nanotechnology, we have to realize that there's lots of benefits. In this case, actually improving you know, the, the health outcomes of, of infants. And so we can't, we don't want to be afraid of nanotechnology. We really just want to understand uh, how it's used more and uh, as, as various uh, regulatory agencies understand how to uh, regulate it, we need to understand that nanomaterials offer fantastic benefits, as I showed in my first slide. There's always this balance between applications and implications. You know, I like that point. Paul, you know, we don't need to be afraid of it necessarily, just to have a clear understanding. That's a, that's a really good point. You know, you mentioned uh, CMP, chemical mechanical planarization. Of course, here in Arizona, Intel and others have lots of facilities that are that are doing CMP. I, you know, one from sort of naively thinks that companies are good at point of source. Is that the right term, remediation here? Where they're, and you mentioned this in your talk, I mean, I just assume they always like to tout how clean they return water to the environment. Um, do they do, you know, remediation right there for these nanoparticles or do the majority of them escape at that size? So, so they're not regulated. Things like silica is not regulated, whether it's dissolved silica or silica dioxide nanoparticles. Um, we've worked in, we have various projects in collaboration with the Semiconductor Research Corporation, work directly with uh, some of the people who are online here today. Uh, and so uh, it, it, it really varies. Uh, so sometimes just the turbidity or color uh, can influence discharge regulations, but these aren't specifically uh, required to be removed. And so they might not specifically be required if they discharge to a sewer and then there's a wastewater treatment plant downstream. So not everything that you know, people discharge is bad. Uh, silica is, turns out to be fairly, uh, fairly uh, inert. Uh, there was an, another question very related to this in the chat session about if they were discharging something of value, uh, could anyone recover or recycle these nanomaterials? So when we were doing that nano prospecting, we actually found nanoscale gold and nanoscale silver. Uh, when we did the electron microscopy pictures, 
And so we've written a paper then on, we measure the amount of gold and silver, and the amount of gold and silver there is about the same as low-grade ore. And if you were to think about a, a community with a million people over the course of a year, there's about eight to ten million dollars of nanoscale silver and gold in those wastewater biosolids. And so, you know, it's not enough, you know, it's not a, wouldn't make someone rich, but it, it is a, a recycling opportunity that people are now, now exploring. And so uh, in the 70s, there was uh, a semiconductor uh, fabrication facilities in the San Francisco Bay Area that were discharging fairly high levels of gold. Uh, and they were actually occurring at a wastewater treatment plant. The wastewater treatment plant was uh, thinking about mining the gold uh, out of there. And before they started doing that, uh, the semiconductor industry found a way to trap their gold on site because there's a value. But there is one a wastewater treatment plant in Japan, which at a fairly large scale, does recover gold uh, from their wastewater biosolids. So things of value will drive some of this recycling or on-site control, I think. I'm fascinated by that. I have a colleague online from uh, the NAC group, and he's already thinking about assigning some of his graduate students to gold recovery. I'm just kidding about that, but um, very <laughs> Well, we've written a uh, paper on it, so have them contact yeah, us first. Yeah, I will. <laughs> You know, Paul, the, uh, I appreciate your time in taking answering these questions. And as you see in the chat window, they're, they're, they're really good questions. And it made me think a lot about, about this topic. We appreciate doing that. Paul, I'm just going to kick over to, let me call it an advertisement here for a moment. Uh, we do have some upcoming webinars in this series. The next one is on Monday, June 13th. And I love this title, Self-Powered Wearable Devices for Monitoring Personal Health. So not only do you get wearables, but you're going to power them yourself as well. Uh, and you can see the presenter there from North Carolina State. That's another NSF uh, center there. It's not in the same as, as, uh, as your NUT center. I don't think it's the same ERC, is it? I don't think so. It is but, actually in the same family. Yes. Oh, it is. Okay, good. Yeah, good. Our, our engineering research center called NUT, or Nano Enabled Water Treatment Technologies, is a Nano Systems ERC. Oh, it is. Okay, good. So we'll have another one on these on these wearable devices, and we're looking forward to that. Well, thank you again for the time today, colleagues. Um, I'm going to go forward to a couple of slides here. Paul, we mentioned. I know those are your. Um, Oh, yeah. Sorry. There, so excuse me for clicking through them, but I, I thought we would just leave them there. Um, everyone online, to access this recording and slides, number one, we're going to send you an email, but you could visit our sponsor's site, nanoforme.org or ncisouthwest.org, and you can navigate right from the home pages there to these webinar recordings and the link. And those recordings persist. They're up there, they're on YouTube, and they're easy to access. So you will uh, get an automated notice of that. Paul, as we wrap up here, I'd like to thank you again. And, and colleagues online, I'm now going to launch a survey that helps us get better. So I'm going to change the screen right now, and the survey will come up. Now, I want to tell you that some of you who have Macs, you may, the survey may not launch in an open browser window. So I'm going to go ahead and put that survey link into the chat window, and you can click on it from there. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining from coming around the world for this webinar. Paul, it was our pleasure to have you uh, with us this morning. Thank you again. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity. Good. Colleagues, please take a, a moment to, to do our survey. That officially ends our webinar. I'm going to stop the recording now, and I'm just about ready to put that a link into the chat window that officially ends our webinar. Thanks, everyone.